Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Hauser. I am the Ecology Outreach Manager for Friends of the Chicago River. Um, we are a nonprofit here in the city of Chicago, and uh, we are concerned with the health and vitality of the Chicago River throughout its course. I, uh, my personal role is as the, uh, the leader of the Chicago River Schools Network. I actually help uh, teach teachers and, and students. It's a teacher support program to provide curriculum support and uh, resources to teach their students about the river. Um, I'm not as versed in some of the other areas of Friends, but I will do my best to answer questions in those areas if you do have them. Um, I encourage everybody to maybe jot down questions, since this isn't a live presentation, jot down questions that you may have during the presentation. You can put them in the chat room. Um, I can answer them later via email or at the very end, if you want to stick around, we can unmute everybody. And if you have questions, I will stick around and answer them as long as we have time for. I believe the, the time slot is well until one o'clock. The presentation itself will probably only take about 30 or 35 minutes. I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions and answers if you have them. But looking at the format, this is designed as um, one of seven parts. Uh, what I did is I, I have a standard uh, high school presentation that I use for high school and adult audiences. And it's about two hours long, which is a little bit long for a, a YouTube video or an online presentation. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And so what I did is I took it and I split it into um, five parts, essentially maybe six if you really want to think about it that way. That's beginning with this section, part two through seven is the history of the Chicago River, starting with uh, river geography and ecology. Today we'll throw a little geology in there as well. Um, and I added on a, uh, a first section just about Friends of the Chicago River so that if people weren't familiar with uh, my organization, you could actually view that one as well. That one's already recorded. Uh, we did that one on Tuesday. Uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, just what is the river, where is the river, the geography and ecology of the, the Chicago River. If you're dying to know more about the history itself, those are going to be coming up next week and the week after. Uh, on part three, we're going to talk about uh, Native Americans, <clears throat> and the development of the city itself around the Chicago River all the way through about uh, the Industrial Revolution and the, uh, the advent of skyscrapers. Um, part four is more about water quality and the developments around that, Bubbly Creek, uh, and the Union Stockyards, uh, Goose Island, things like that. Part five is uh, specifically talking about the reversal and a lot of the canals that were built around the city of Chicago. Uh, through wastewater treatment and uh, the deep tunnel and things like that. Part six are uh, modern water quality issues, things that we're still struggling with uh, to deal with about the river. Um, and then part seven are more of the land management issues that we have in the modern era with non-native species and soil erosion and flash flooding and all things like that. So if, if your questions, if you have a dying, uh, a, a burning question about one of those sections, uh, those dates are posted. It's every Tuesday and Thursday for the next uh, two and a half weeks or three weeks. So if you have a, a, a real urge to watch one of those topics, uh, I would encourage you to uh, rejoin us on one of those other dates. Uh, but I will answer questions if you have them now, if you're only able to do this one. People are still trickling in from the waiting room. Um, so river geography and ecology, specifically to today, I'm gonna to try to stick to the topic. Uh, a lot of this stuff, as you can imagine, is uh, interconnected and, and some of these issues pop up in more than one section. Today, Specifically, we're going to talk about the river, uh, what it looked like in the present as compared to the past, what is a watershed, uh, 
the glaciers, the, the Wisconsin glacier from about 12,000, 15,000 years ago, and how it transformed the, the surface of the, the area and created the watersheds that we see today. We're also going to talk quite a bit about the, the pre-settlement ecosystems that were here in Chicago, um, specifically the importance of prairie fire, which comes up later when we talk about uh, the Chicago fire and the development of the city. It's a different presentation. We'll talk about riparian zones around rivers and their importance, and then a lot of time on what makes a river healthy. There are uh, four aspects that I want to kind of cover. Stream flow, uh, water quality, habitat, and diversity, biodiversity. All right, so if everybody's ready, nobody else has been coming in the waiting room for a few more minutes, um, we're gonna get going. Again, just to repeat, if you have a question, um, I'm not able to see anybody with video, so just uh, go ahead and put it on the chat room or um, hold, just jot it down, just write it down and, and then you can answer them at the end, all right? The Chicago River, if I asked a lot of you, um, I'm assuming almost everybody here is a, a, over 18, maybe even older than that. If I asked you what the Chicago River looks like to you, this is probably the image that pops into your head. Uh, the downtown canyons, as we call them, um, the architectural tours, the new river walk, the bridges over the, the river, and all of the skyscrapers. This is uh, kind of our face to the world. This is what Chicago is known for. Uh, this is what the Chicago River looks like in all the guidebooks and all the magazines when you see it. Um, the Chicago River itself is quite long. It's through the connected aspects of the river. It's 156 miles. This is but one mile of that 156 miles that is down there. And the Chicago River is like every ecosystem, like every river, it's, it's diverse in itself. It has a lot of different reaches and aspects. Uh, it starts as three tributaries in the north, uh, coming out of what once was prairie and through groundwater, and it comes down through the north side of Chicago, merged with a, uh, a river from the south that, that, that came out of a swamp, and they joined and went out into Lake Michigan. And they're all very different. You can see photos if you Google them from all over the watershed and it looks very, very different everywhere you go. But this is the aspect of the river that most people know is downtown. For a lot of people, when I ask them what the Chicago River is all about, um, they think about the greening of the river on St. Patrick's Day. That's the probably the image that a lot of people have. And um, that's a whole separate issue having to do with water quality and, and a modern issue. So if you want to know more about that, I would look at the later presentation in three weeks. This is not what the river looked like through all, a lot of its history though, right? So the, uh, the river, again, another picture of the downtown canyons. Uh, you can see uh, Marina City there on the, on the right. Franklin Street Bridge, the Wells Street Bridge, the LaSalle Street Bridge, Clark and Dearborn. We are, whoever took this picture, they're just about right above the Michigan Avenue Bridge, the DuSable Bridge today. Um, just for reference, you're actually looking west. Uh, Merchandise Mart is up there on the right at the top of the screen. The North Branch goes off to your right and the South Branch goes off to your left. Uh, here's the picture I wanted to show you. The Chicago River, for most of its history, and even today, um, kind of emerged from the prairie next to uh, Lake Michigan, and it's um, a shallow, kind of slow-moving, your typical Midwestern Creek River. Uh, it's not a raging mountain stream. It's not the Amazon. It's not, you know, miles and miles wide. Uh, servicing a large area. The watershed is fairly tiny compared to most rivers um, and it doesn't have a huge slope or gradient. It actually does not have a lot of uh, white water or, or riffles, things like that. It's, uh, it carries a lot of sediment. It is your typical Midwestern river that, that flows out of the, the plains. A lot of good loamy soil uh, 
and so it, it's it's filtering a lot of that so it has a lot of sediment content a lot of mud in it uh, that's just your very typical midwestern river uh, by the way i will mention uh, that right through the middle of the screen it looks like there's a line across the river this uh this image i believe is from uh, Middle Fork Savannah or somewhere around there up in Lake County. That's actually a Native American weir that they put in the river so that they could uh, trap and harvest fish out of the river. So that's a, a fairly older structure. It's about several hundred years old. It's the only man-made thing in the, uh, the image here. But the image itself, I believe, is from around 1910. We didn't have cameras 300, 400 years ago, so we have to settle for that today. All right, so moving on to geography and a little bit of geology. I wanna start with what is a watershed? Um, this is a good thing for especially a lot of high school students to know about before we start talking about the Chicago River. Uh, a watershed um, is defined as the area of land that uh, traps and flows together the, the, the rainwater, the precipitation in an area. So it's an area of land usually bounded by high ground on the edges. And it's kind of like a bowl or a plate and it filters all the water down to a common outflow into either a pond, a lake, the ocean, uh, whatever the edge of the watershed is. <clears throat> and watersheds can build on each other. So you can have smaller tributaries that feed into larger streams, that feed into larger rivers, that will feed into the ocean per se. So every Every bit of land on the planet is part of some watershed. Water will always move from high ground to low ground, uh, gravity fed, unless it's affected by some uh, outside force. Uh, humans will pump water up sometimes, but otherwise it always flows down inside its own watershed. And sometimes, I'll just mention now that uh, sometimes that's catastrophic. You know, water will go where it needs to go when it rains. So if that's through uh, the street or through some town or through your basement, it's going to do that. Water is just, uh, it's responding to the physics of the situation. So turning specifically to local, what does the Chicago River watershed look like? Well, that's a tricky issue because it's changed over the years. If you go back several hundred years, we actually had three separated river systems in Chicago. The Chicago River historically flowed out into Lake Michigan. The Calumet River was to the south, but separated also flowed into Lake Michigan. And the Des Plaines River was the first river to our west that flowed to the Mississippi. And so you can see in the first image on the left, they're separated by a black dotted line. That actually is a subcontinental divide that um, separated the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico. Chicago River, again, where we are right now, historically flowed into Lake Michigan. Uh, and you can see through 1850, 1950, and today, those are just arbitrary dates. Uh, you can see in the, on the il illustrations that through the, the green lines and the orange lines, those are canals that were added uh, since the founding of Chicago. And we have endeavored to connect all of these systems uh, and put them all together and uh, reverse the flow eventually of the Chicago River, which was done to protect uh, the drinking water for the city. And we're going to talk about that in much more detail when we get into the reversing of the river presentation in two weeks and uh, modern water quality issues. So I'm not going to, it's not like I'm glossing over it, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it right now. Uh, the image on the right, you can see the present day boundaries of the city of Chicago in green and the present day boundaries of the Chicago River watershed in yellow. The watershed itself actually extends all the way up into Lake County, almost to Wisconsin, and does go over the uh, boundary into Indiana. And just to reiterate, it doesn't flow into Lake Michigan anymore. Most of the time it actually flows to the Mississippi now. Zoom back out a little bit again. Uh, if we talk about watersheds in North America, in the United States, we're talking about predominantly the Mississippi River watershed in the middle of the continent. 
And this is made up of smaller watersheds like the uh, Ohio River watershed, the Missouri River watershed, the Arkansas River, the Red River, things like that. They all flow together into what we call the Mississippi River system that flows historically and always still does into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and that is the one that is just to our west. The Des Plaines River is still part and always has been of the uh, Mississippi River watershed. The Great Lakes watershed um, actually puts together water from the U United States, part of Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, or Minnesota, and parts of Ontario, and, and drains into the, lake, into the Great Lakes, and that goes out through the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the reason I'm throwing this up here is this has a lot to do with the, the next presentation, which is the development of Chicago. Uh, the reason Chicago is where it is, is because of its uh, unique placement right on the boundary of these two watersheds. So in the development of North America, as settlers came west and they were looking for uh, easy ways through uh, to travel, they were going by boat. And so they would go as far as they could into the Great Lakes watershed, which ended up being uh, places like Chicago. And from there, they could hop easily into a river and go into the Mississippi, Mississippi River watershed and get to places like St. Louis, New Orleans, uh, hopping and j jumping off points to the west so that they could go to, to Denver and San Francisco and places like that. Um, so it's a very unique placement. It really is the reason that Chicago is where it is and why it developed into the large city that you see today. A lot of you may be familiar with the map on the right. That's obviously a, you know, a, a, just a political map of roads and counties and things like that. We're all familiar with that. The image on the left is a watershed map of Illinois. So every one of those different colors is a smaller watershed that connect to each other. They're all tributaries. Most of them go into the Illinois River. The Mississippi River is obviously the entire western boundary of Illinois. Uh, they all flow into that, with the exception historically of the Chicago River, Calumet Rivers. Uh, so I just want you to start thinking about what is a watershed and how those actually are kind of superimposed over everything that humans have built on the landscape. Again, if we zoom into northern Illinois specifically, these are some of the names of some of those rivers. The Illinois is the big one flowing into the Mississippi, but there's the Rock River, the Green River, um, the Vermilion River, the Maison River, the Kankakee River, and the, the Fox River and the Des Plaines River, which all flow into the Mississippi. And then there's this little guy here, the Chicago River watershed, and it historically was separated from the rest of the state. We put the boundary, the subwater, or the subcontinental divide on there. This is the, the separation where everything to the west would have flowed to the Mississippi, everything to the east would have flowed into Lake Michigan. And why is this? Well, um, my degree is in geology, and so I love throwing this in here. I don't often share this with students, but uh, I think I'll, I'll put this out here for a lot of the adult audience here. Uh, the Wisconsin Glacier was the last of many glaciers during the Ice Age. Everybody knows about the Ice Age. Well, the Wisconsin Glacier was our last glacier about 15,000 to 12,000 years ago. Um, and it covered North America to the extent that the blue is on that image there. So it swept down through uh, Lake Michigan, kind of depressed Lake Michigan. Uh, so that when it receded, it created the lake itself, but it actually swept down through about halfway through Illinois, halfway through Indiana, covered, would have covered Chicago with more than uh, 750 to 1,000 feet of ice. That's how thick that glacier was. So the mechanics of a glacier, if we, if we see the uh, brown rectangle to the right, say that's the landscape and you have this bulldozer of a glacier that comes over the landscape, well, what it does is, is it gouges the land and pushes up earth in front of it, picks things up, and as it deposits, as it actually stops advancing, it will stay in the same place, 
but these things are not static. So it's not, the ice is not just frozen and it stays there. What it does is that leading edge of the glacier is always melting and there's always ice pushing from behind. So it's like a conveyor belt. So as the glacier for, you know, hundreds of years would have stayed in the same place and actually melt and melt and dump out material, what we do is we have this created hill in one's place and it's called a moraine. And a moraine is unstratified. So it's, it's as if you took boulders and rocks and pebbles and sand and silt and everything, all these different sizes of sediment and, and material and just dump them together. Um, when a river flows, it stratifies sediment so that you see uh, all the sand ends up in the same place on the beaches. All the big boulders get left behind and all the silt goes out to the ocean. So there's a gradation and a, and a sorting of these elements. But in a glacier, uh, ice doesn't care about how large uh, a bit of grain, uh, you know, whether it's a, a speck of sand or a boulder the size of a house, it carries them both at the same speed. And so it dumps these things out and it creates these uh, um, hills that we call moraines. If you want to see some in Chicago, some of the last uh, remaining ones are actually down in the Palos area. Those are in the forest preserves. They're very well preserved. They've never been uh, altered or uh, changed. If you want to see some um, more, a little more locally on the north side of Chicago, I know as you drive along Golf Road uh, and you go out past uh, the golf courses and what there, you can actually drive west and you go up over a hill and then down and then over a hill and down. Those are moraines from different periods of, of glaciation. And depending on how long a glacier stayed in an area, the higher the moraine would be. In our area, there may be only 20 to 30 feet tall in some places, but it's enough to actually separate the watersheds so that, um, you know, this map of a glacier, that blue almost parallels the Great Lakes watershed exactly. And there's a reason for that. Okay, I know I'm geeking out and, and talking a lot about glaciers. Uh, with respect to everybody, I think we'll move on. As you can see, as the glacier goes away, there's the lake. That's Lake Michigan. So just to kind of bring all of this together, what makes rivers in Illinois flow where they do? Well, the answer are your glacial moraines. So if we throw up a map of glacial deposits at the end of the Wisconsin era, uh, they're actually not in the green, but they're actually in the white. And so let's make them easier to see. Those are all glacial deposits. And you'll notice if we throw that on top of our watershed map, they make, they form the boundaries of a lot of these micro watersheds. Uh, and so it's not surprising that the water flows where it does because these are each individual basins that will flow and fill up with water until they dump into the next uh, river and they accumulate bigger and bigger going downhill until it gets to the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Turning our attention to more of the geography of the area, so what did the glaciers leave behind as they receded? This is the, uh, the area around Chicago. You can see the map. Uh, the city of Chicago is about halfway up the screen, right on the right edge. Uh, you can see Cook County, DuPage County, Lake County is at the north, Will County is at the south. Uh, and what I've done is this is a map of uh, pre-settlement ecosystems that are uh, on the map there, and each one is a different color. And again, just like with the glaciers, I'm going to highlight them in black. Uh, let me go back and have this do it again. The dunes, uh, there's a, there was a complex of dunes along the lake, uh, and these are sand-driven ecosystems. Uh, a lot of grasses and forbs. Uh, they're windblown ecosystems right along the, the lakes. The largest complex in our area is up in, uh, in Lake County up near Wisconsin, and I'm going to highlight it in black. It's going to flash there. That was the largest complex. That's actually still there today in large part. If you want to see a better example, go over in Indiana and go to the Indiana dunes or over into Michigan. There are some larger complexes of dunes over there, but we had some and we still do. 
Let's see the next one are wetlands. Those are in purple. They're flashing in black now. A lot of wetlands up in the Lake County area uh, and then down around in Southern Cook County. Historically, we had some wetlands. Uh, we'll talk about Mud Lake when we do some of the history, but that's actually the, the portage. That's the link um, from the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River is that large complex of wetlands that are kind of on the southern part of the map there. Uh, if we had a lot of rain, you could actually travel from one to the other, but that was the portage or the pickup between the two watersheds. All right, the big one, uh, prairie. Historically, Illinois was covered about 60% of the state was prairie. Uh, and um, let's see, it's dominated by wildflowers, uh, forbs, grasses. Uh, it was said that when settlers first came here, you could uh, travel on a horse through the prairie and not even see the horse. Uh, you would just see the, the person kind of floating over the grass. It was so tall. Some of these grasses were, uh, you know, eight to 10 feet tall and uh, the root systems would go down 20, 30 feet into the ground. Uh, very good sponges for soaking up rainwater and, and putting into the groundwater. Um, prairies were, I guess, seen by a lot of settlers. I've heard that they, they, they saw them as a barrier to development when they first came here. We, we created a lot of farms and the agricultural industry and the prairie was the first thing to go. And so uh, farms and towns and roads and, and things like that, they would start to chip away at the prairie. The prairie was an easy thing to plow under and get rid of. And uh, so sadly, even though Illinois is called the prairie state, uh, we have lost 99.9% .9 of our prairie historically over the years. We've gone from 22 million acres down to about 25,000 or 2,500 acres left in the state today. Um, and the importance of prairie can't be understated. Uh, it's a very important ecosystem in our area and there are a lot of people trying to restore little parts of it. We're never gonna get back the entire 12, 22 million acres. I am sure of that. But prairie fires are very important. If you look at uh, the historic area, the prairie fires would have started um, from lightning, uh, you know, spark you if you had a, a drought or something like that, uh, these things would become a tinderbox and could be sparked off by lightning. Uh, sometimes even the, the, some of the Native American cultures would start fires to uh, capture and, and, and hunt buffalo and bison. Um, but prairie fires were, they would start, uh, they're very they could be big, but they're generally slow, low-burning fires. Uh, they only would start if there was enough fuel and oxygen and temperature. And, and they would start and they would be windblown and they would actually generally go from west to east and clear the landscape, clear the prairie, which would then regenerate. Prairies love fire. And so they're an ecosystem that's, that's designed to be burnt every once in a while. But these prairie fires would sweep through the landscape till they got to a river. And because it's a slow and low burning fire, they would actually go out. Um, and so if you look at pre-settlement Chicago, the, the black, a lot of the prairies, uh, right, they go west right up to the western edge of the Chicago River. And then as you hop the river, because the prairie is not, there's no prairie over there and you're not getting it burned, uh, you get the influx of trees and whatnot. And so you have different ecosystems on the east side of the river than just on the west side. Just on the east side of the river, the first thing that would never be burnt, you would have uh, floodplain ecosystems. Uh, these are largely, you, we would call them forest, but they're deemed floodplain because it's a different soil type, because the water is getting, uh, is infiltrating into the, the ground there. Um, and so they're dominated by trees, but they get wet all the time. As you go up, things would start to burn a little more frequently. You'd get wetland or woodlands. Uh, there's my friend, the deer, hiding out in the forest there. And then as things got burned more often, you would start to see savanna ecosystems further up the watershed. And those are just like a prairie, but you have the occasional tree, mostly bur oaks and things like that. 
And then of course we have the rivers and the lakes. Chicago River is kind of hard to see on there, but it is there. So in Chicago, kind of sum up as people first started arriving here from the European settlements and through the Native American culture, up until the creation of, of the city of Chicago in 1837, we had prairies largely off to the west, all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And we had the occasional patches of savanna and forest along the river. Later, as the, the settlement of Chicago started creeping in, uh, you can see DuSable in his cabin there, other people started moving in. They, the first impetus was to start developing right down along the river because that was the natural throughway and the transport. And again, we're gonna talk a lot more about this uh, in the next two segments of the history. All right, just a little quick ecology and then we'll be done. Uh, the first idea that I want to throw at you is what is a riparian zone? Riparian zones are very important. It's the land right next to the river. Uh, plants and trees and, and things are usually hydrophilic there. They're water loving. This is the floodplain generally. Uh, water, the plants that are in a riparian zone love getting wet. They are associated with the river. They have developed that way. Uh, animals can be aquatic, semi-aquatic, or terrestrial, either way. They're in and out of the river, but they, almost all of them rely on the river for some aspect of their life. Maybe they're amphibious, uh, or they come to the river to drink, but they live near the river. Riparian zones uh, are very important. A lot of this is going to connect with the water quality issues we're going to talk about later on other days. Um, they dissipate stream flow energy. They filter surface runoff. They provide habitat, uh, they mitigate water temperature changes. Uh, the riparian zone actually will shade the river quite a bit, uh, absorbing impacts to climate change, urbanization, flooding. Uh, and they also are beautiful. I think it's nice. I think when we all picture a, a nat natural river, it's always going to have a nice riparian zone, uh, a buffer of green plants around it. I don't think a lot of us like the, the look of a river that has a wall or a, a you know, just a, a shoreline with grass or something like that. All right, last idea I want to throw at you is uh, there are four aspects that make a river healthy. Uh, all river ecosystems are defined and dominated by water. And the food webs, in other words, the animals, the collection of animals that are supported by uh, water, these, these uh, riparian zones, uh, they're all water dependent producers, so they all spring from some kind of uh, algae or grass that is growing in the water usually, although first and level consumers can be aquatic or non-aquatic living next to the river, but they still rely on the river. Uh, I want to actually throw the idea at you that rivers are not just the water, but a river ecosystem actually by definition includes that riparian zone around the river. So the first thing that I want to talk about is just stream flow, just to, to kind of get you thinking about this, is river level high or low? And we have a little graphic here, the river going up and down. And the more important aspect is consistency. When you're living next to a river, you want to know that the, the water level is going to be fairly consistent. So if it's bouncing up and down and fluctuating greatly, that is actually a disturbance. Um, and so natural healthy rivers will not um, flood all the time, you know, on and off, on and off. There might be a seasonal flood, that's, a fine, that's, that's okay. You just want predictability. If water isn't moving very fast at all, it can become stagnant, which is not necessarily a bad thing as long as it's uh, expected, again, by the animals living there. There are some organisms that love still water, And as long as you know that that's what's happening, uh, the animals will be able to cope with that. A low oxygen environment you're gonna have, it's gonna be dominated by uh, worms, snails, um, little mollusks, very, very small fish, uh, some insects, not, but not a lot of things that need a lot of oxygen. You're not gonna have your big fish, in other words.
This is a typical shot of the Chicago River, slow moving water, no rapids, no riffles, a moderate oxygen environment, four to eight parts per million of oxygen. You're gonna see your, your uh, smaller fish, maybe you know three or four inches, crayfish, a lot of insects, uh, and still some of your mollusks and worms, although not as many, they'd be at the bottom of the food chain. And this is something we don't necessarily see a lot in Chicago, your fast and moving water, high oxygen environment. This, is, this would be for your big, big fish. Uh, migrating fish love uh, high oxygen environments. Um, and they're great. They're great for exploring and finding a diversity of animals. But I, I take kids on field trips all the time and there is no one spot in the Chicago River where you're gonna find everything. You have to kind of pick and choose what you wanna see based on the environment because they're paired. Uh, water quality. When you think about water quality, uh, is the visual and odor is a good color, stable turbidity. Turbidity is the amount of sediment in the water. The chemical health of the water, uh, phosphates and nitrates, other nutrients, and no pollutants, no lead, no mercury, things like that. And there's, there's also biological health, just a good variety of plants and animals and no excess bacteria, which is a common problem in the Chicago River. We can't get bacteria levels that are fairly high. The chemical uh, pollution that's in the Chicago River is generally non-point source pollution. Uh, so this is stuff that comes from the community, talking about your antifreezes, your fertilizers, your motor oils, your battery acid. A big one is road salt. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue that road salt is a bad thing. It does save lives, but it also kills fish. To take the fertilizer example, um, here's little Susie. She lives in a house downstream. Uh, maybe it's Chicago, I don't know, but there's a farm upstream in the watershed. And if the farmer uses an excess of fertilizer, those phosphates and nitrates can actually seep into the groundwater, seep into the river and into her drinking water, especially if she's drinking well water. And these cause a lot of problems and, and it can, it doesn't have to be just fertilizer. It can be arsenic, it can be lead, all kinds of things like that. All right, third one, uh, habitat. You need a diversity of ecosystems. So you need marsh and wetland, you need river and stream, you need little eddies and currents. Uh, you also want a diversity of rare river characteristics. It's good if a river is uh, pool and riffle, deep and shallow, meandering and straight. And by pool and riffle, I just mean that there are little ups and downs, like it shallows out and becomes a riffle and you get a lot of good oxygen there. But then it'll also deepen and have a deeper pool ecosystem that maybe has a little lower oxygen. You're just providing a variety of things for animals. It's kind of like a buffet, to use a very gross example. Uh, but to have a variety of things available, you're going to serve a larger variety of animals. Some of the things that FRIENDS does and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers here is an example to improve biodiversity and habitat is to cut buckthorn and other invasive plants out. Uh, that removal will allow a greater variety of animals and plants to live there. Uh, and the dam removal, that picture specifically is the North Branch Dam just south of Foster Avenue. That was taken out uh, about a year, year and a half ago. And its removal has allowed fish to now go back and forth up the river. Uh, and so that is improving uh, their habitat. Biodiversity, very, very important uh, in a river ecosystem. Uh, are all of the environmental niches filled? In other words, uh, think of it as like a job description for the river. You have all these little tasks and jobs and they all need to be filled, whether you're a producer, consumer, a predator, a decomposer, and if that niche is filled by many different organisms, that's going to be healthy. If it's absent or only filled by one organism, that is unhealthy. Here in Chicago, because we're an urban area, uh, this slide I think pops up in three or four different presentations because biodiversity is one of the biggest issues. Uh, but here we have all native plants and animals and for many reasons, like uh, losing range or habitat, some organisms kind of are, thro are thrown back, disappear. They may even be 
extirpated or become extinct locally. Not that those specific animals are extinct now. It's just an example. But species can all be also be affected by pollution. And that knocking back of the native species can actually allow non-natives or invasive species to come in. And this is kind of your murderer's row of invasive species here in Chicago. Purple loosestrife, rusty crayfish, Asian carp, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, uh, zebra mussels, European starlings, garlic mustard, Asiatic clams, and probably number one, uh, European buckthorn. I have a whole presentation on buckthorn we could talk about if you'd like. Specifically for the river, uh, Asian carp are not in Chicago, they're just outside of Chicago, but we do have a big problem with non-native crayfish in the Chicago River. Uh, the ones in green on the top are your natives, the virile crayfish, calico crayfish. Uh, they're, they've been knocked way back from their historic ranges. Uh, and a lot of it's been taken over by the rusty crayfish, which is an invader from the, actually the late 19th century into the 20th century. Um, and then the recently the more of the red swamp crayfish, which has come in over the last 20, 30 years. And they, they are just bullies. They, they knock back the native, native populations and you don't see them as much anymore. So I guess if I had an overarching message with the uh, geography and especially the ecology of the river is Friends really wants to create a wild river. Um, we don't necessarily want to go back to the way it was. I don't think we could even go back to the way it was in the 17th century, but we want to try to recapture a little bit of that and promote the health and welfare of a lot of animals and plants as much as we can. So the four rat factors of river health, remember that all four factors are interconnected. You can't really have water quality without biodiversity. You can't have good habitat without good stream flow, for instance. And all four factors are measured on a continuous scale. It's not like you have biodiversity or you don't have biodiversity. Uh, it's either, uh, you know, you have a little bit or a moderate amount or a lot of biodiversity, you can actually go out and measure these things. And all of this is to create um, one of the greatest metropolitan rivers in the world, the Chicago River. And um, that kind of wraps up our presentation for today. I thank everybody for participating. If you, again, want to stick around and ask questions, um, and actually let me... get to the presenters, unmute everybody. If anybody has a question for the entire group, you're welcome to ask it now. Otherwise, uh, if you are needing to go somewhere else, I, I thank you for participating and you certainly can uh, leave us now. But if you want to stick around and ask a question, feel free to do so. Yeah.